everyone and welcome to Java Basics. Today we will learn a bit of theory so we can prepare for the next video on JPA. We've used object-oriented programming, also known as OOP, all this time, but we only briefly discussed one of its properties. I will explain the underlying theory of what we've been doing so far and point out the code that we already wrote that leverages those ideas. The code for this video is available here. It's in the description too. Don't forget to star and follow me on GitHub while you're there and here also while you're at it. I mentioned OOP before and even mentioned it has three principles. Also mentioned the most important one, encapsulation. As a reminder, encapsulation means that each object has its own private data, its own state. It hides it and exposes methods that we can use to access state. This lets us separate the high-level architecture from the implementation detail. Think of this like your car. You don't need to know the current position of your third piston when driving the car. You just need to get to a point. The car exposes an interface to you, controls and details. You can open the hood and inspect the engine but you don't need that normally. All that information and control over the internal workings is too much. That's the essence of encapsulation. It's wrapping up implementation details into a usable, understandable package. Just so we are clear, let's first explain the difference between a class and an object. A class describes how an object are created. Think of it like a rubber stamp that we use to stamp the paper. A class can be human, while we are each an object instance of type human. A class describes the traits that we have, which have a particular value in the object instance. When we define something as static, it means that it applies to all the object instances of that class. This is an organizational system that provides a lot of power. Let's say we have these two classes. The private method in class A can invoke the public method in class B. No problem. The inverse won't work though. A public method in class B can't invoke a private method in another class. This is prohibited and won't compile. The private method in class A can't access the private field in class B either. Notice that the methods within class B can access private field, a private field without a problem since it's in the same class. But since the field in class A is public, it can be accessed by any method, even outside of the class. This is the essence of encapsulation. To make encapsulation work for us, we try to follow a few guidelines. We want to have as much private code as possible. By keeping things private, it means we can easily change them later on. We will know that no one else depends on this private method or field. That means we can look at one class and understand what's going on without looking at a huge project. That's what encapsulation is about. A public field can be used in any way by anyone. It's hard to place a breakpoint on it when debugging, and we can't modify it. So the common practice is to avoid public fields. There is a special case of public static final fields. These are constants. They can't be modified, and we can use them to define values that only change when we build another version of our application, if at all. Inheritance is the second core principle of OOP. A class can derive another class and accept all of its traits. We use the word derive interchangeably with inherit. We only wrote one class that derived so far and, it only, and only did interface inheritance, which I will explain soon. We also used classes that inherit from other classes but I'm rushing ahead a bit. Let's look at some examples. Composition isn't a core principle of OOP, 
but it really helps to understand it before we discuss inheritance. Let's say I have a class that represents a user. It has many methods and fields, but for simplicity, I'll just show two. Last login and verify login. This would look a bit like this code. I won't include the fields or the implementation because those just don't matter. They are encapsulated. I can create user objects, as many as I want. But let's say some users are managers and have more permissions in the system. Say we have a promote user method and only a manager can use that API. In this case, every time the method is invoked, we will need to check if the user is even a manager. That's inefficient and inconvenient. This can get worse. What if admin users are the only ones allowed to delete a user object? In that case, we will have yet more code that makes very little sense here. The code would be organized badly as the manager related and the admin related code will be piled in a single class. There has to be a better way. We can use encapsulation for this. We can separate the methods for the manager and move them to a different class. We can do the same for admin and then have an instance of the user object in our current object. This way, manager can work like a regular user and so can the admin. Notice that we can simply invoke the methods on the internal user object and effectively expose the same API as the user object exposed. This is called composition. It's a bit painful, but it's very power, a very powerful concept. It's also uh, it's a, a bit painful because we have to deal with the user object and be aware of the hierarchy. Instead of doing it uh, this way, we can expose a get user method and return the user object. That might be okay for some cases, but it might also break encapsulation. So it isn't ideal. I'm skipping the admin code since it's more of the same and not very interesting. Inheritance works like, thi like this. We use the extends keyword to inherit the capabilities of a parent class. Manager inherits all the capabilities of user. That means all the public methods in user will just work on manager as if they were a user. The same is true for admin. In both uh, regards to manager and user. In fact, every object in Java extends uh, except for one inherits uh, from the object class. The one exception is the object class itself. If you don't write the extends clause, it's as if you wrote extends object. The object class defines some interesting methods like toString equals hash code and get class. They are all available on any Java object. This means I can write code like this and it will work seamlessly. In fact, there is a term for that in object oriented programming. Is a. It sounds a bit silly, but it helps us explain inheritance relations nicely. Admin is a manager. That means that admin has the capabilities of manager. Admin is a user as well. That's because it inherited the manager class, which in turn inherited the user class. Manager is a user, as we just mentioned here. But is a doesn't work both ways. A user is not a manager, and so forth. Which brings us to the third and final principle of OOP, polymorphism. That's a scary word for a not so scary uh, complex concept. In fact, we just saw it a moment ago. In this code, the manager class is assigned to a user object. That means we use it as a user. The object appears 
as if it's a different object in the hierarchy, and we can treat it as such. In fact, we've done it for quite a while in the code. Remember this code from webcontroller.java, which we got from an even earlier attempt. We're creating an instance of the ArrayList object, but we're assigning it to a base class, technically a base interface, but I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Why do we do that? Why not just use ArrayList for everything? The best practice is to code to the simplest abstraction you can afford. Then if I want to change ArrayList to some other class, I can do it without changing the rest of the code. This is called coding to an interface. Another important concept goes with, inheritan uh, with inheritance is overloading. Let's go back to the user example uh, to explain this. Let's say that uh, verify login is great, but we need to run another check for the case of the manager. Just to make sure, we can override the method by writing a method with the same signature, which means the name and parameters must be identical. If we do that, the overridden method will replace the existing method. We can still invoke the method for the base class with the super call. Notice that in the last line, I use the AND statement to chain condition, uh, condition like I uh, described in the last video. This will only check if the parent method from the user class returned true. Notice that when I override a method, I can completely replace its functionality. I have no obligation to call super. Modern Java code usually declares the override annotation when overriding a method. This isn't required, but it's recommended. Let's say you override the method and misspelled the name or used the wrong parameter type or the method was removed. The override annotation will result in a compilation error in those cases that will help find the problem sooner. Just so we're on the same page, if I allocate a user object, then the override code won't be invoked. The user code will only will be invoked. Yet if the object in instance is a manager or an admin, then the new code will be invoked. The type uh, on the la left hand side has no bearing on this. Continuing that thought, an inheritance hierarchy doesn't need to be linear. I can have an anonymous user type that doesn't let me log in. I can't remove a public method that's already there, but I can block the call to the login method. This will work seamlessly for code that accepts a user object because uh, anonymous is a user too. Let's talk about the different uh, metaphor for this uh, next thing. Let's say I have a rectangle. It's got uh, typical APIs you would expect. So would a circle. But when you want to draw a circle or a rectangle, the code is pretty different. The same is true for most of the other capabilities still. I would like there to be a common API. Then I can do something like this, where I loop over the shapes and just draw them without knowing if it's a circle or a rectangle. I can write a shape class that includes these methods. That's pretty easy. But what if I invoke new shape? or forget to implement one of the methods. We can't allocate uh, an abstract class. That means we can't write new shape. It won't compile. We can only create a new subclass of shape. That subclass must either be abstract or it must implement the abstract methods we defined in the class, 
notice that the method draw has no body, just a semicolon. Yet the code that loops over the shapes to draw them would work on the abstract class just fine, since the objects themselves are from a concrete class, which is the opposite of an abstract class. Abstract classes are regular classes otherwise. They can still have fields and everything you would expect from a regular class. Java has single inheritance. Some languages have multiple inheritance. Single inheritance means we can only inherit one class. Every class has one parent. That simplified many things in the hierarchy, but it, all, it is also a limiting factor. The problem with multiple inheritance is state. It can create a situation where the same class is inherited twice, and the state of the class is harder to navigate. Java solved that uh, elegantly with interfaces. An interface is a special class that has no fields. Historically, methods in an interface had to be abstract and public too. This is no longer the case, but the default of public abstract methods uh, in an interface remains. T taking our previous example into consideration, the interface for shape would look like this. Notice that draw is public and abstract. We just don't need to explicitly say that in this case. Remember this code? List isn't a class, it's an interface. In fact, it's an interface that inherits from an interface called collection. Any class can implement multiple interfaces, but an interface can only extend one interface. Instead of extending, we use the implements keyword when implementing an interface, and it forces us to implement all the methods in the interface or define our class as abstract. There's a lot more to discuss here. This video was overlaid with theory, but next time around, we will jump right into the code and cover JPA, the Java persistence architecture. This will show you why we have all that OOP stuff in the first place. If you have any questions, please use the comment section. Thank you.